take your Bibles, open them up to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. We left off last week at verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 said, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And then verse 12 went on and it said, For it is even a shame, yeah, it is even a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now, some people criticized Jesus for hanging around sinners. You remember that story in Matthew chapter 9? Do you remember that one where he's invited to a tax collector's house for dinner? Tax collectors were hated. They were despised by the Jewish people because they pocketed extra money and cheated people. So no one liked the tax collectors. Jesus called one, his name was Matthew, to be one of his disciples. He in turn invited Jesus to his house now, some of his friends were a little bit, little bit on the wild side, a little bit on the worldly side, I guess you'd say. There were prostitutes probably there, other publicans. There were other people who were sinners, and they were in that home. And uh, the holier-than-thou uh, Pharisees came in and taught the Jesus' disciples and said, why? Eateth your master with publicans and sinners. Oh, why is he doing that? And uh, that is found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11. And then Jesus, when he heard them, Matthew 9, verse 12, his response was, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. He came to heal and to lead to salvation those who were in their worldliness. So, Ephesians 5.11, again, look at it with me if you would. Just go back a couple of verses from where we are beginning our study tonight. And again, it says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's what the Apostle Paul said. So by Paul saying that, was he suggesting that what Jesus was doing was wrong? No, he wasn't. He, not at all. See, Jesus did not have fellowship in that sense with the unfruitful works of darkness when he was in Matthew's home. Uh, fellowship is, is talking to one another. It is spending time with one another in that sense. But it also means to associate with something. And so Jesus was not associating with their sins. He was not conforming to their ways. He was there to rebuke them in a loving way to them and let them know that what they were doing was wrong. Jesus had nothing but the utmost absolute respect for other people. And that is what we all should have for one another. And I believe that that is what we're going to find in verses 13 through 21 here in the sixth, uh, fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians, that we should respect one another. You know, the golden rule says uh, in Matthew 7, 12, Therefore, what things soever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. So we need to treat others the way we want to be treated and to show respect to one another. And uh, so Jesus did not conform his ways to the world. And Paul told us we must not conform ourselves to the world. In Romans 12, 2, he said, be not conformed to the world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In 1 John 2, 15, John the Apostle wrote these words for us. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So it's just all a thing of respect is what we're looking at here this evening. May the Lord bless us as we study his word together. We begin with verse 13 where Paul writes and says, but all things that are reproved. Again, it goes back to understand to the context of scripture. We need to look at the preceding verses and the postceding verses. 
uh, of any scripture to know its context. In the preceding verse, again, uh, where it says in verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. In verse 12, why even to think of those things that are done by people in secret is a shame. So he says, but all things that are reproved. And the word reproved is a word which means rebuked. And we reprove and we're, we are to reprove and rebuke those who are in sin that we are related to, that we are friends with, that we are co-workers with, that we are fellow students with, that we are neighbors with, people that we know that are in sin and wickedness and immorality and worldliness. We must rebuke them for their sin but not in a scolding way. We must not show up with at someone who is living in sin with a 275-pound King James Version 1611 edition Bible and, spray, and speak fire and brimstone to them. That is not what Jesus is suggesting. Now that can have its place and its time, but what I'm saying is when someone is in sin, we, we, we can be a turnoff to them. We can be a turnoff if we come on too strong. So we need to approach them out of a heart and out of a spirit of love and a tenderness, a forgiving heart, and go to them and let them know that what they're doing is wrong. And we can let them know audibly with our mouths and we can let them know physically with our life and how we live. We must live the Christian life in front of others. As the old saying goes, someone once said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. So uh, a sermon lived out by us as Christians speaks absolute volumes. So let's keep that in mind. But all things, it says in verse 13, that are reproved or rebuked are made manifest by the light. Now, ladies, uh, I'm going to pick on you for just a second. If you are dusting in the house and you think you got everything just immaculately clean, then you raise up the blinds and the sunlight comes in and you see dust that you didn't get. Doesn't it really irritate you? Doesn't it bother you? Have you ever opened the door and the sunlight comes in and you see a little bug crawling across the floor and you go stump on that little thing and kill it and dispose of it and you're thinking, well, I didn't see it until I turned the light on or let the light come in through the door. Light reveals things. Light shows us things that we don't typically see when it's darker. So, therefore, it says, but all things are, that are reproved in verse 13 and made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Light reveals things. Now, Jesus is light. If we have Jesus in our heart, we're living for him, and we are in the, uh, on the endeavor to go to someone that we care about who is living in some terrible sin, and we let them see Jesus in us, Jesus is light. John 1, 4 and 5 says, in him, that is Jesus, was light, and the light was, the, uh, was life, that is, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And again, Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. If any man followeth me, he shall not walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. So when we have Jesus in our heart, and we approach someone in a spirit of love, and we want to tell them that, hey, look, I care about you, I'm not judging you, but I care about what you're doing and I want you to know that the Bible says what you're doing is wrong and we do it in a gentle and humble and spiritual way, then that light will reveal to them what they're doing. It will reveal to them that they are indeed in sin if we do it in a respectful way. But if we approach them uh, scornfully and yell and criticize and negatively, and then that can be a major turnoff to anyone. So we need to respect others. And, and it goes on here and it says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Those who are in the world who do not know Christ do not have the light of Christ in them, and they're living in darkness. And so Paul just says, Come out of this darkness and receive the light. Uh, that's kind of like it was with the blind man in John chapter 9. 
the blind man, you know, Jesus told him, to, he, he made this um, mud and he, and he spit upon it. We say that's so gross, but it was for medicinal purposes in those days and saliva. And, and so it was mixed in with that mud and Jesus rubbed that into his eyes, his blind eyes, told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam and, and come back. And well, he did and, and he came back seeing. His eyesight was restored. Now, Jesus could have just looked at him and just said, be healed. He could have done that. But he did something that uh, the people could associate with, something that was uh, visible, and, and he just uh, did it that way for whatever reason. I can't explain. He just did. And he told the man to go uh, wash in the pool of Siloam and come back, and he said, I can see. Now, going back to those religious uh, holier-than-thou Pharisees, they came and they said, well, now to the man who was once blind but now could see, uh, he, Jesus healed him physically and spiritually. So he's one who could truly sing the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He could truly sing that. Now, uh, uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, the Pharisees, they came to him and they said, uh, who is it that did this to you? Who is it? Is it that Jesus man over there? The one that's preaching? That radical man that everybody's listening to and following? Because see, they didn't like him. And they said, is it him? He's a sinner. Well, the blind man came back, and I think it was in John, John 9, 25, and he said, whether he is a sinner or, no, or not, I know not. He didn't know really know who Jesus was. He said, but this is one thing I do know, whereas once I was blind, now I see not only could he see physically, but he could see spiritually. Jesus radically, completely, and totally healed him by giving him light. And then we go to verse 15. Uh, Paul said, see that you walk. Now walk. Walk is a, is a word mentioned many times in the book of Ephesians by Paul. And the word walk is a word which means a lifestyle. It's how we live. And, uh, you know, uh, Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with him so much that God just said, one day, come on home, and uh, I'm taking you home with me, Enoch. Enoch uh, walked with God, and he's the, by the way, he was the grandfather of Noah. I don't know if you know that or not, but anyway, Enoch walked with the Lord, and, uh, and, and that word walk there also means his lifestyle. So Enoch lived for God. And so when Paul says, walk circumspectly, the word circumspectly means carefully or it means sensibly. So Paul said, make sure that in your life, Ephesians and West Pelzerans, is that a word, West Pelzerans? I made it up tonight. Anyway, Ephesians and West Pelzerans and Williamstons and uh, Piedmontsons and, well, I'm getting out of control here now. But anyway, see that you walk circumspectly or walk sensibly or carefully, not as fools, but as wise. We're to be a wise people and we're to live a wise Christian life. And, and to be wise means that we are going to walk with the Lord in the way that we will be respectful to one another. Now verse 16 says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now the, there, are 100, there are 24 hours in a day. And if you do your math and you multiply 24 hour a day times seven days in a week, God gives to us 168 hours a week. And uh, of that week, we, uh, if we're still working, we work at least 40 of that 168 on average. Some a lot more, some maybe some less. But that's uh, typically the standard is 40 hours in the work week. And then we sleep a lot and we do a lot of other things, other activities, work around the house and leisure activities. We go shopping, we eat out, we do all these things during the week, but how often do we do things for the Lord? 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul said, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything we do should be for God and his glory. So redeeming the time means taking advantage of the time that is allotted to us in life by God, taking advantage of being good stewards of the time that God gives us by doing things for him and for his glory. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, it says there in verse 17 too. His will is general, 
will for all people is to get saved, to know him as Lord and Savior. So we need to make sure that if we're going to be a respectful Christian to one another, then we, number one, we've got to make sure we know him as, as our Savior. And then, I want you to look at verse 18. He said, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, whether you believe in total abstinence from drinking alcohol or not. I, I will stand here and say that alcohol in some cultures in some parts of the world is just a common beverage as we would drink sweet tea or water. And some people in some places do. Now, here in the Bible Belt, it's not the way, uh, it's not a common drink. But I'm not going to stand here and judge anyone for drinking alcohol. I don't, and that's me. And I never have, and I never plan to. But I'm not here to judge anyone who does. But I will say that God's word says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. And the word excess is a word which means dissipation. And the word dissipation, I looked it up, is a word which means corrupt, impure, and immoral. If one gets drunk, you know, I, my favorite show is the Andy Griffith show. And one of the funny characters is Otis, the town drunk. And he comes in all wobbly and has his own key to the jail cell and sleeps on Saturday night or what have you. And uh, I, I think one episode he told Andy and Barney, make sure he's, they wake him up early the next day because he had to be at choir practice at church. Now, we laugh about things like that. We do. We laugh and we say, that's funny. Well, uh, but, but in reality, alcohol can be habit forming and it, uh, it can offend a brother if, we, if they are a young Christian and we were to drink in front of them, it, it, could, it could offend them. It can uh, hurt our own witness or testimony. And if we have any doubt whatsoever as to whether or not we should touch it, then we shouldn't touch it. We should stay away from it. So, all that being said, let me tell you that on the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, Peter and the disciples, boy, they were, they were speaking in unknown tongues because God gave them that ability to do that on that day. They were speaking in unknown tongues and they were, they were saying things that didn't make a, a, a bit of sense to people that were around them. In fact, some people said, I think these men are drunk. Yeah, they, 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 they must be drunk, and they, and they believe that they must have some new kind of wine. You know what? They were drunk, and they did have a new kind of wine. But they were not drunk on alcohol. They were drunk on the Holy Spirit in the sense that that, that was the new wine, the Holy Spirit. They were filled with God. So it says here, don't fill yourself with a drink or a beverage that would offend someone or hurt someone or hurt yourself, but be filled instead with the Holy Spirit. Fill yourself up with the Spirit. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, then we speak to ourselves in, uh, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, singing and making melody in your heart. That's all those disciples were doing. They, they were saying, you know, yeah, we, we're, we're speaking the, the melodies and the hymns and, and the psalms and and we're quoting the scripture, and, and they were doing it in unknown tongues, and people thought they were drunk, but no, they were just filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, there is what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and there is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. All of us, when we get saved, we are instantaneously baptized by the Holy Spirit into the family of God. It's not something that happens later. It happens at the moment of conversion. And filling is something that must, must happen every day in our lives. Every day. You know, it's like a car. You have a car and the car looks nice in your driveway. But if the car gets low on gas, it ain't going to go anywhere. So what you got to do when the tank starts getting low, go down to the gas station and fill it up, right? So same thing about us as Christians. When our tank starts getting low, we need to open God's word. We need to get on our knees and pray. We need to worship. We need to sing the hymns. We need to do whatever it takes to fill ourselves up spiritually. We need to ask God every day to take us to his infilling station to fill us up with his Holy Spirit. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is something that happens every day. Now, that's what was happening with these disciples. They were infilled with the Spirit. 
And being that they were filled with the Spirit of God, they were a people that were so thankful and appreciative to anything. They were given thanks always for all things. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, he said, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And you say, well, I can't give thanks to God for bad things that happen in my life, for horrible things that happen in my life, for, for terrible things that happen in my life, for sicknesses that happen in my life, for losses that happen in my life, for deaths that happen in my life. I can't thank God for everything, Pastor Randy. Yeah, you can. Yes, I can. Yes, we can. The Bible says we can. And let us all understand that, and we've been studying about Job on Wednesday nights, and the question was asked, why would God allow such terrible things to happen to such a good man? And like I said, I don't know the answer to that. I just know that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. He loves us. He'll hold our hand through any storm and trial any of us may ever have to go through. And let us all remember that if we love God and we are serving God, we are living for him then Romans 8, 28, that's the verse. All things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are the call according to his purpose. So everything works out when we know the Lord Jesus and we're living for him. And then he says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting. Now, I'm going to close out with verse 21, and next week we'll start with verse 21. Or no, I won't be here. Next week I'll be on vacation. I'm glad I'm going on vacation because next week's talking about wives being submissive to husbands. So I'm going to ask if Mike Bearden will preach this sermon next week so I can get out of it. <laughs> it's not what we think, folks. Look, it's all about love. Loving one another. And so we're going we're gonna to close out with verse 21. In two weeks from now, we'll pick up with verse 21. Submitting yourselves means yielding and respecting. You. We need to just yield to one another and respect one another uh, in the fear of God. If we'll fear God, then we will treat one another right. I do believe that. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require thee, but to fear the Lord thy God? to walk in all his ways, to love the Lord, to serve him and, uh, in all our ways. And we're, we're to fear God. And if we fear God and revere him and respect him, then we will have the right approach and, and, and treat one another good. And that's what Christianity is all about. It's being a loving, caring person who is displaying the light of Jesus through us. Light shows up dirt. If we do it in the right way, we can help people see the dirt in their lives and, uh, and see that they need to turn from certain ways in their life. And uh, so a a anyway, that's our lesson for tonight. I do hope that you have received some things from it and uh, I hope that you have taken heed to it. And uh, as the Lord leads us, may we make whatever decision he'd have us to make then as we close this service with our invitational hymn. Let us pray.